This new town in Poland was designed to meet all the requirements of modern Marxist men and women. It was to be the model town, which would show what socialist planners could do to meet the aspirations of the workers. In this case, workers specially recruited to staff the huge new steelworks built close by. But predictably, the workers had their own ideas about what was ultimately important to them. And those ideas turned out to be very different from what the planners had been expecting. <laughs> the church that the planners expected to wither away has attracted ever greater support from a people deeply distrustful of Marxism. At this traditional ceremony of blessing the Easter eggs, Father Kazimierz Jansarz, one of the priests at the parish church of Misowice, is almost mobbed. I consider communism the greatest evil for people, for humanity, and especially for our own country, which has Christian roots. More than 90% of us are Christians, Roman Catholics, and I consider it a nonsense that we should be dominated by a 5% minority supporting an alien ideology. This year Easter is a little sad. I look at the faces and I see a fatigue and a sense of oppression. But there is the hope of our country's resurrection to become a free, good Poland. Because in a way people have put up with communism, but now they are sick to death of it. It has passed into history. Now we must rise again to become something different, better, greater. The estate was built with no provision for a church, so the people started gathering under a rough cross erected on some waste ground. More and more people started coming. Soon, despite official harassment, they started building a church. The cross stays as a reminder of those early days. I came to Mieszczejowice exactly 10 years ago. There was still no church building then. We celebrated mass in a shack in the fields, all seasons, rain or shine. The people stood in the open. We had a simple outhouse, which was used partly for storing building materials for the church, partly for teaching the children in. So we started by giving many hours of religious instruction during the week. But after martial law was declared, we also had to take care of the adults, the interned, the suffering families. The standard of living was falling drastically. How could I preach the gospel if these people sometimes had nothing to eat or nothing to wear? First I started to organize the students, then the workers from different factories. We worked on the principle of preaching the gospel through mutual help. Among the regular attenders of Father Jan Sasha's church is the Fugil family. Kazimierz Fugil works in the Nova Huta steel mill. If the Communist Party obeyed its Leninist ideals, like we Christians must obey the Ten Commandments, everything would be all right. But they've changed everything. The faith and the hope, which we have as Christians, help us to survive these difficult times. Christ has risen, so we believe that our truth and our ideals will one day be raised to a dignified place. The slogans on the Easter eggs proclaim their loyalty to solidarity, the banned free trade union. It has led to arrest and imprisonment. Have you ever spent Easter in internment? Uh, no, it was May. We had mass. Cardinal Maharski came. He even cried. Cardinal Maharski visited you? Yes. With Wałęsa? Yes, he was there. They celebrate Easter with a meal of ham, eggs and salad, which is lavish by their usual standards. 
But for the Fugill family and for millions of devout Poles, Christ's victory over death at Easter is cause for a real celebration. It also symbolizes the victory they hope for against the dead hand of communism. For them, active membership of the church and support for solidarity belong very firmly together. The giant Novohuta steelworks where Kazimierz works have become, like the Gdansk shipyards, a seedbed of resistance to the government. Last May, the works were brought to a standstill by a strike for higher wages to cope with almost 60% inflation. Kazimierz was a member of the strike committee and was arrested after riot police forced the workers to reopen the plant. Since martial law in 1981, life for him has been very tough. In the factory, if I join the new trade unions or the Communist Party, I'm sure that after all these years of work, I would have been promoted by now and be earning much more. I would not have to work a three-shift routine and life would be a lot easier. I have never attended the 1st of May processions. I always considered them a fix. I have never taken part in elections, nor has my wife, nor so far has my son. We boycott all state functions, well, nearly all. No, all. We tell our friends that it's not material values that are important, but spiritual ones. We never go away on holiday, but instead we go on the walking pilgrimage to Częstochowa. Because we think it's better to spend the time getting spiritual refreshment rather than lying somewhere on a beach. We don't queue for things like paper. We try to avoid queues. Even basic things like toilet rolls are always scarce. So queuing has become a major preoccupation for everyone except party and military bosses who have priority access to the shops. Constant shortages have made the ordinary people bitterly critical of the government. Often they tell us to budget carefully. Well, I'd like to. I'd eagerly include in the menu some liver or a sausage, like the ones our parents make in the country. But we can't get hold of them in the shops. Even though they'd be much cheaper, I just can't buy them. I've got to buy what there is. It's a little easier for me to manage than most, as I am a dressmaker, so I can save on the cost of clothes. I couldn't afford to pay the full price, but by sewing and knitting myself, I can cope. Medical supplies are especially hard to find. Like other churches in the city, the Fugills Parish receives supplies from friends and charities overseas and distributes them free to those in need. The church has become a parallel welfare service which plugs the gaps in the state system. I got something here for one of my family who's suffering from a bad circulation problem. Then I also managed to get some baby food for my grandchildren. And I got a vaccine which I've been looking for for several months. Jacek Koron is a leading Warsaw intellectual. An agnostic, he has come to share the Catholics' dissatisfaction with Polish Marxism. In our situation, we are not talking about the pure Marxism of Karl Marx, the theoretical system of Marx, which was a very interesting 19th century system. What we are talking about is a particular quasi-religious ideology made into a system and practiced by the Communist Party. 
this ideology has failed, together with the hope that the party is in any state to rebuild the world. The moment it became clear that the totalitarian system introduced by the party was a system that incapacitates man, at that moment Marxism failed. In Poland, the government was not chosen by the people, it was imposed on society, it is foreign to it. like to remember the good old days in music and song. I found myself sharing that sense of nostalgia in the streets of El Krakow, one of the finest city centers in Europe. The splashes of color in the springtime flowers made it seem all the more appealing. I could see why it has become one of Poland's most popular tourist attractions. In striking contrast to the studied drabness of the new housing estates, the beautifully restored buildings speak of the Poles' pride in their own history as a nation. But Poland's is a deeply tragic history, written in the intensity of her people's suffering. In this peaceful Warsaw Cemetery are commemorated the millions of Poles who in this century alone gave their lives for their country's survival the memorial to the Poles who defeated the Bolsheviks in 1920. The terrible expanse of nameless graves from the Second World War. The poignant silver birch crosses marking the graves of the young people who died in the Warsaw Uprising against the Nazis. and the memorial to the victims of the shameful Katyn massacre, long blamed on the Germans, but now acknowledged even by the Russians as a Stalinist atrocity against the elite of Polish society. This figure of Christ, desolate, sorrowful, almost broken, is very Polish. And here at this church in Warsaw, he focuses the grief of Poland on the disasters of the Second World War, when nearly a fifth of the population lost their lives. And as it happens, this very church was served by Poland's most recent martyr, brutally murdered, but still alive as a symbol of what it can cost to live out the ideals of the gospel in a communist state. Father Jerzy Popiewuszka died a cruel death at the hands of the secret police because of his identification with solidarity. A gentle, unassuming man, he had become too troublesome a priest. So in a carefully planned operation, he was kidnapped, beaten, bundled into the boot of a car, and finally drowned in a reservoir. Now he's an object of veneration. People come from all over Poland, not simply to pay their respects, but to seek the courage and inspiration to continue his struggle. People like this group of young seminarians. The pilgrims bring flowers to decorate his tomb and leave strongly worded banners around the church railings, spelling out their commitment to fight on for a free Poland. The words, we are alert, painted at the entrance to Father Popiewuszka's church, offer a defiant challenge to the Polish authorities. Drawn by Father Jerzy's example, Piotr and Gregor Fugel are among the many young people who take their Christian faith seriously. You both go to church. Now, what part does going to church play in your life? We have a very narrow field of action. There are three possibilities open to us. Either we become communists, or we leave the country, or we can stay to fight. And to fight means to be on the side of the church. 
What do you think draws so many people of your age group to go to church? I think mainly it's the eternal significance of certain values which the church carries with it. The love of truth, freedom, justice. In our country, there is a great need among young people to seek reality. And they can do this in the church. It definitely offers a very attractive outlook on life. Oczywiście polska teologia wyzwolenia to jest niedobra nazwa, bo Polacy nigdy w ten sposób w swojej myśli... One of the events at their church that attracts a few girls is the evening classes where uncensored lectures are given in history, theology, politics and current affairs. Tonight's lecturer is Professor Kochowski, a Dominican just back from a visit to members of his order in Brazil. He's able to compare the struggles of the poor in Brazil with the plight of the people in Poland. His audience find that fascinating and highly relevant to their own situation. It's something they will hear about in no other way. Why do you come to a meeting like this? To find out what the objective truth in Polish society is and to discover certain things about social, religious, political life. Now, what do you mean by objective truth? Objective truth is the truth I can't find from any other source. I can't find it in the mass media, the television, the radio or the press in Poland. Why do you think this kind of a meeting is important? It's important because uh, the people who meet in church circles like this want to be themselves. That is, they can be individuals. We create something here which is not going on generally in Poland, in the mass media. And it builds a world of values which, in my opinion, enrich human life. In a system which feeds itself on lies, there exists an institution which every Sunday preaches the truth, whether in a magnificent gospel reading or through a weaker sermon. The church has always preached the truth. That has been a very important influence on the awareness of freedom of the whole nation. Can I have the tribune in Ludwig, please? The Polish Communist Party finds the truth about its failures and widespread unpopularity embarrassing and potentially dangerous, and so it controls the news. Most newspapers that you buy, like this one, are published by the state and sold in bookstalls owned by the state. Private publishers, like the church, have to submit all copy to the state censor. No wonder people are desperate for what they call the objective truth, that is, news that has not been filtered by the party. Znak is a leading Catholic publisher of books and of a weekly newspaper. Its aim is to make available news and ideas, especially from abroad, that the government would prefer to go unreported. The newspaper, Tygodnik Bożekny, constantly runs the gauntlet of the censor's office. So what was taken out this week? Well, there is a whole article by Janusz Okrzesik removed that was about the alternative service to the army. As usual, a lot gone from Kisiel's column. And they've also taken an article by Adam Michnik, an assessment of Joseph Stalin. We'll fight for that article and might even take the case to court. Some small news items have gone, like the piece about the Slovak Catholics demonstration in Bratislava. That's been removed. We try to stand for what I could call Catholicism, which would be an open Catholicism, open to all other attitudes and ideas, and uh, try to get into a dialogue with them. 
and uh, accept uh, every good wherever it is created for the sake of uh, doing something good indeed. Doesn't that bring you into conflict with the state, particularly in forms of censorship? Of course, we would publish uh, more interesting books and better books if there wasn't censorship, which begins at the level of the Ministry of Culture, which sometimes crosses out a book from our plan, and you never can <coughs> be sure why and what happened. Uh, you can guess. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and we got to a certain point used to it, so we try now to, uh, which is a danger, psychologically speaking even, but we try now to adapt our policies so as to not to have too much trouble and to go on publishing books which can, after all, be published, or which have a chance to be published. Since its publications are produced on state-owned printing presses, Znak has to do the census bidding. Those who want to preserve their independence have to go underground. In the basement of a private house in Warsaw, a more humble printing operation is carried on in secret. These printers risk up to 10 years imprisonment if they're discovered, so they move on every few weeks to reduce the risk of detection. The equipment isn't very grand, but it is portable. The material printed here spreads news of various groups throughout the country that have been formed to resist the state. One of their publications is Deserter, the magazine of Veep, the Movement for Freedom and Peace, a band organization run from a family flat in Warsaw. <laughs> Jacek and Magdalena Czaputowicz. He's an economist and she's a historian. They started VEEP in 1985. Their original aim was to encourage conscripts to refuse the army oath of allegiance to Russia. VEEP's other aims are geared to conservation, the importance of living in a clean environment, also to disarmament, international liaison, and the problem of minority groups in Poland. We are also campaigning for the removal of the death penalty. As Jacek and Magdalena get ready for their youngest daughter's third birthday party, family life looks normal enough. But in fact, Jacek has served time in prison for his activities and has not been able to get a job since. I always remember the times when Jacek was arrested and the fear associated with it. For people who live in Western Europe, it must be difficult to understand. For example, every time the doorbell goes, you think it might be the police. <laughs> Of course, when he was in prison, and you have to remember that he was threatened with 10 years imprisonment, it was very difficult for me. Psychologically, I was in a bad way. My mother, of course, gets upset very often because she also has difficult experiences behind her. During the Stalinist period, she spent eight years in prison. She was condemned for being a member of the resistance during the war. She knows prison and the system, so it's understandable that she's anxious. But I've always received help and protection from her. Oh, no. The important issue of the moment is to change things around us. And to do this, you have to start with yourself and with your own community. We have to rebuild the social links which have been broken, and in this there's an important role for women.
A woman can make a special contribution through the family because a big problem in this country has been the breakup of family life and the breakup of community life. The family friends are also active in Veep. The party is a chance to discuss Veep business. Jacek is sure his flat is bugged, so the chatter helps mask the political talk. Most of Veep's activists are involved in the church. Since the introduction of martial law, there has been a great increase in social activity, especially within the framework of the church. For example, in my immediate circle of friends, one of them, who is an activist in VIP, is responsible for pre-marital counseling in his parish. Another is a leader of one of the traditional pilgrimage groups to Częstochowa. Others are active, organizing groups of Catholic intellectuals. There's definitely a return to faith at the moment, and that's normal in situations where you're under great threat. You start to think about fundamental values, and you think about your life. In this sense, the Church of Poland is a great spiritual support and the return to religion is definitely very genuine. In this church in a suburb of Warsaw, Wiep began after a hunger strike in support of young conscripts who refused the army oath. Father Kantorski, the parish priest, has always encouraged his congregation to relate their faith to national affairs. The majority of them are working professionals. For instance, doctors, academics, journalists, lawyers and private businessmen. Therefore, all my work and everything we do here is adjusted to their particular needs. I think I could say that my personal task is officially to preach the truth. But he also seeks to engage non-Catholic intellectuals in open discussion of leading contemporary issues. Churchgoers, agnostics and atheists are all glad to take advantage of the opportunities he provides, which are hard to find elsewhere. Among the regular participants are Alina Kalinowska, a lecturer in biology at Warsaw University. Richard Bugaj, an economist at the Polish Academy of Science, and Jacek Majarski, a journalist and TV commentator who lost his job when martial law was imposed in 1981. We work together very closely because the communities of the faithful, the parish communities, for example, are the only authentic local centers where people work together, building social bonds in this desert. Why have so many intellectuals made some kind of rapprochement with the church? People need something transcendental because they need to ask why they are alive. The answer can only be found in something that outlasts the life of the individual. People the world over need that, but they need it all the more in a totalitarian system because that system removes all meaning to life. Not only is it ineffective, but it destroys life. It destroys social life. It destroys the country. Work has no meaning. And in this situation, the search for a purpose in life becomes very significant for everyone. And especially for an intellectual who lives by an ideal. And here you can see an answer is most easily found in the church. It is found most easily in the ideal of God. It is unquestionably one ideal that gives meaning to life. 
Personally, I am not a man of faith, not because I believe that there is no God, but because I don't know how to believe in God. It's beyond my strength and capacity. For me, it's a very complicated issue. But I totally understand all those, I could even say I am jealous of those who have found such a purpose in life. By encouraging free political debate among well-informed and critical friends, Father Ken Torsky strays beyond what some see as the proper boundaries of the church. It has sometimes strained his relations with officialdom of both church and state. The church in Poland has always supported the people, although the hierarchy doesn't always show it. For example, one member of the church hierarchy declared that throwing stones was not a means of dialogue. He was criticizing the people, but at the same time he wasn't criticizing the government when it used truncheons and cannons. And yet their use of force was also not a means of dialogue. There have been incidents like this. I am only giving one example, but it leads to a certain dissatisfaction and bad feeling against some of the hierarchy when they seem to be taking sides with the government. One cause of conflict has been Father Kentorski's support of a priest silenced by Cardinal Klemp, head of the Polish church. The priest, Father Malkowski, is allowed to preach at Kentorski's church. A fierce critic of the regime, he's kept under police surveillance. My life was seriously threatened in 1984. I don't know how close I came to death, but I know there were plans to kill me and Father Jerzy Popiuszko, as well as other priests. I knew I was being watched, and there were repeated break-ins at my home, which were clearly organized by the secret police. I was also interrogated by the police and had several official searches. Could you tell us why you were silenced by Cardinal Glemp? Cardinal Glemp explained it in the letter he sent me. He said, first, that it was for my own good, and second, that it was because I preached hatred, which goes against the teaching of the Gospel. When I tried to reply to this, the Cardinal avoided further discussion. I expect he was pressurized by the state authorities. Cardinal Glemp, at the head of the church in Poland, is in a delicate position. He knows that if he gives the impression that the church is a front for solidarity or any other opposition group, he risks a clampdown by the state, possibly supported by Russian troops. On the other hand, the more radical people, including a few of the clergy, say that he's too sensitive to both the carrot and the stick offered by the state. I'd guess that most take the view that he's playing a difficult game with great skill. When I visited him in his mountain retreat, I got the impression that he is very cautious, but that he has much to be cautious about. He has constantly to be aware that in the end, the church has the freedom it does have by courtesy of the state. The church exists at its side. That is not just theory, but practice. And the boundaries of this coexistence were laid down by Cardinal Wyszynski, my predecessor. If the state interferes in the internal activities of the church, then that cannot be allowed. However, we also understand that the church cannot get involved too much in politics. It must stand in defense of the moral laws. Is it always easy to draw a distinction between what is moral and ethical on the one hand and what is political on the other? Aren't the two in fact, often very closely intertwined. Yes, there is a connection. Politics ought also to be moral. But to achieve this, society has to be penetrated with Catholic Christian ethics. And we must distinguish very clearly between those ethics and pure politics, which are the struggle for power and influence.
At the regular masses for the motherland, where Poles pray for national deliverance, it's hard to make such a distinction. I asked the cardinal if he thought these masses were too provocative. I consider it a necessity, as many Polish people see attending these services as their duty towards the motherland. Naturally, we take care that they don't become political meetings. Nevertheless, these masses for the motherland, when understood in the light of faith, perform an important role. At party headquarters in Warsaw, the government argues that church and state can rub along together because they have to. Alexander Merke heads the Department of Religious Affairs. For a long time, there existed in the party the view that religion would cease to exist very quickly. And in the Catholic Church, too, there was a conviction that socialism was only a short episode of history. Today, on both sides, there is now a recognition that in the socialist state of Poland, the Catholic Church and religion will be active for a long time. Do you think that, in, in general, the Church makes responsible use of the freedom it's granted? I would not like to generalize about the Church. The Church is living people, and there are responsible members and irresponsible ones. The irresponsible group is the minority. Generally, the Church makes responsible use of its freedom, taking into account the interests of the state. But there are exceptions. We do not like to dramatize them. Yet the Poles flock in thousands to the patriotic masses. They have a special quality which binds together traditional Catholic piety and the assertion of Polish identity. The words they sing with hands held high in victory salute are both lament and inspiration. Oh, my motherland, so often bathed in blood, how great is your wound today, how long your suffering goes on. So often you have longed for freedom, so often your freedom has been crushed by your enemies. But in the past it was crushed by foreigners, today brother is killing brother. I must ask you this, because it has been put to us by a number of priests that we have met that they have been threatened with uh, personal violence. Um, how do you react to allegations like that? I absolutely deny that. It's total rubbish. The example of Father Popiuszko was an isolated incident. In every society, there are people who want to be cheap heroes, pretending, for instance, that someone has threatened their life. Are you then saying that Alexander Merke is lying? Yes, he's lying. How do you, as a priest, cope with the constant fear that one day you yourself may be attacked? You can live with fear if you have courage. Courage can live alongside fear. God gives you courage through the Holy Spirit and Jesus. If you make use of that strength and you have an inner conviction that you are doing the right thing, then you can live with fear. In the church at Nova Huta, the altar has been curtained off 
A folk concert is in progress, and a young man, the winner of last year's student music festival, sings about the death of Father Popiwushka. He holds his packed audience spellbound. <laughs> In a regime that is uncomfortable both with dissent and with creative activity, it's almost inevitable that the church emerges as the patron of the arts. It's not a very comfortable relationship. The clergy complain that the artists are too demanding, and the artists complain that the clergy are ignorant of modern art. But you can't help being struck by the fact that on these bleak and dreary housing estates, it's to the church you have to go if you want to see decent modern painting, decent modern sculpture, decent modern architecture, or even hear good folk music. <laughs> The young musicians performing here tonight have come from all over the country. They relish the chance to sing band songs, full of irony and biting comment on the state of Poland. Nie lęka się wojska, zakazany naród, nielegalna Polska. Certainly, the church does perform the role of patron of the arts in this country. It's connected with the fact that people like artists and sculptors can decorate churches in a modern way, since so many new church buildings are being constructed. And artists who can't express themselves in the normal way can do so in church when they can't work elsewhere. Tableaux depicting the tomb and resurrection of Christ are an Easter tradition here in Poland. Magdalena Gorelska puts the finishing touches to her work here at Father Jerzy Popowiszka's church in Warsaw. We compare the suffering, the way of the cross of Father Jerzy to that of Christ. That is why I united both those events with a white and red flag, the throwing of Father Jerzy into the water and the death of Christ. Christ is covered with a white sheet on which is written, we will rise again, which we strongly believe. We understand it in terms that we will win. We will be victorious because we can overcome ordinary difficulties in our everyday lives. The dates which are written here maybe aren't too clear to people from outside Poland, but to us they are all very painful dates, usually marking the death of different people. 1981, the miners and martial law. 1939, the beginning of the war. 1944, the Warsaw Uprising. 1984, the death of Father Popiełuszko. I'm expressing here my own convictions and the convictions of most Polish people. I also hope to raise people's spirits. They are always very happy when they see even a small white and red flag in the decoration of a church. What are your hopes for the coming years in Poland? I have great hopes. I would really want the totalitarian system to be defeated, step by step, by a process of reforms. That is very difficult, but it's possible. And it's made more possible by the fact that the church in Poland at the moment is becoming a church for the people, a social church. It's reaching out beyond the walls of the churches. It's coming out of the sacristy. It's one element of that hope. 
I think that just like gold is purified in the melting pot, so these eight years since martial law have purified the ranks in underground solidarity, which grew up from it. Only hard people remained, those capable of action and sacrifice. If we are going to build the motherland, it has to be on certain real principles, not fictional ones, and on worthy people. I'm constantly surprised by people's refusal to despair here. Surprised because whatever way you look at it, the objective grounds for hope are slim indeed. Swimming against the tide of reason as they may be, people cling on to the hope that things can be different. Now why? Because it seems to me they take at face value the central Christian idea of death and resurrection. They experience their present history as a kind of death and they long for new life, either as an independent nation or under a less oppressive communist regime. Either way, this refusal to despair constitutes a major threat to the Communist Party and a remarkable achievement by the Polish church. Next week, Charles Eliot will be in China. And you can also read about Christianity in a divided world in this BBC book of the series, which is currently available. Look, I'm recruiting for a national firm. Do you want to know what? Say, Daddy. Daddy. I do not want you to carry a blade in this house, right? This is a normal house with normal people. Ah! One more little trip down the Bailey, and the next time you'll be seeing that kid of yours, you'll be a grandfather. The ugly and disturbing face of violence in The Firm. Screen 2, tonight at 10 past 10. In an hour's time at 9.35, Christabel Bielenberg, the subject of our recent drama series here on 2, talks about her experiences as an English woman living in Nazi Germany between the years 1932 and 1945. Now, the second of our three programmes about the composer Hector Berlioz, A Romantic Imagination.